Section nine of the dial, May nineteen twenty, by various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Section nine. A portrait of Renoir at Cajun by Rene Gimple, translated by Gerald Kelly. A friend has said to me, since you are going south, when at Cannes, why not push on towards Cajun? some fifteen kilometers away and try to see renoir i am not sufficiently intimate with him to give you a card of introduction but take your chance i took it Pigeon is an old hillside village facing the mediterranean its fisher folk had defended it against the invasion of corsairs during the middle ages thanks to the picturesque and vertiginous slope upon which it is reared sea rovers came from afar to view the place its outlook is magnificent from its heights one's eyes sweep the horizon would monsieur renoir receive me he had not slept during the night a servant informed me but said she if you will give me your card i'll ask if he can see you i waited in the yard or rather neglected kitchen garden the glazed brick house of the louis the sixteenth type had the air of one of those jerry-built villas thrown together from season to season at watering places their speculative builders being notorious for their lack of taste presently the servant returned if you will be kind enough to enter the dining-room she said we will lower monsieur lower him what did she mean i wondered renoir had been a widower some three years one felt it about the place remnants of the old order had not been swept aside in a corner by the window a table contained some brushes a box of watercolors some little pottery tiles decorated with flowers childish drawings of boats and trees and several plates with renoir's typical nude one knee crossing the other i recognized the color and treatment of the master did renoir work in ceramics then but at that moment i perceived through the partly open door two women descending the stairs carrying the aged painter in a sort of litter my friend in paris had warned me that he was almost senile but i was not prepared for this and it occurred to me to ask myself what business i had there before me was the remnant of a man the women moved his chair about and revealed him holding him securely by the shoulders to prevent his collapse his crossed legs never lost their terrible rigidity he seemed to be all acute angles and of a solid piece like a heavily armoured knight unhorsed in combat he rested on one foot the other was swathed in bandages the attendants settled him in his chair to prevent him from toppling forward seated before me he was a fearsome spectacle with elbows pressed against his body and forearms raised he moved two forbidding stumps of hands bound with cords and narrow tapes the fingers were almost shorn of flesh and their bones seemed to protrude from the thin integument his poor hands withered like claws but i had not yet seen his head which was sunk into his bent shoulders like that of a hunchback he wore a large english travelling cap beneath which his face showed pale and hollow-cheeked his beard was bristly and white and flattened to one side like gorse laid low by the wind how had it taken that crease i wondered and then i was conscious of his eyes and a doubt seized me did he still possess a spark of the vital thing my thought was soon to be answered for since it was necessary to break the silence i risked saying as an admirer of your work i have come to pay homage to its creator i greet you master he motioned me to come nearer and signalled the servant to give him a cigarette which he put into his mouth and lighted then renoir said i have all the vices like that of painting i breathed freely again that sally uttered with a clearness and vibrancy of tone reassured me i laughed and the master smiled at me his indistinct eyes suddenly became animated i noticed over in the corner some ceramics wherein i recognize your hand 
he caught the note of inquiry in my remark yes he replied that was my first medium i am now teaching the art to my godson a lad of sixteen who lives with me it is necessary that every one have a metier and this seems to be agreeable to him it is very difficult however since the same colour applied by different hands will create a conflict of tones he then explained that it was necessary to prepare colours so as to obviate as much as possible this eventual change but have i accomplished that end he queried it is some sixty years since i first saw troyon's great canvas the return of the cattle which is in the louvre when i viewed the painting again several years ago the vapour rising from the muzzles of the animals and the hazy sunlight which bathed the scene had quite disappeared it is for that very reason one must study the action of pigment without cease i asked him if he especially liked landscape well naturally he replied i like it very much but i find it difficult i am known as a figure painter and with reason my landscape is but an accessory and i aim always to blend it with my figures an expression which the old masters never attempted but what of georgeon i protested renoir did not reply and feeling that he did not approve of my question i spoke of corot of whom he said that was the great genius of the century the greatest landscapist ever known he has been called a poet that alone does not explain him he was a naturalist i have studied him without ever attaining to his art i could never approach him yet i have placed myself in the very spots where he painted certain corners of venice and la rochelle and oh those excursions of mine about la rochelle only made me miserable because of corot i wanted to imitate him but he had given colour to the very stones of the place that i could never emulate he threw his cigarette into a bowl at his feet and made a sign to his attendant for another he then continued landscape is the stumbling-block of the painter he will think a certain scene grey perhaps but how much colour one finds in a grey landscape if you only knew monsieur how difficult it is to penetrate the foliage of trees with brushes it is extraordinary i said that you and a few friends are of an epoch that produced several masters when the school of eighteen thirty was at its apogee when no hint of decadence had made its appearance among that group in spite of your admiration for these men you were able to create a school not only rivalling theirs but actually opposing it that was the effect of chance he answered there was at that time in paris a painter named Gler, a swiss who had a course of instruction in drawing for about six francs a month it was very cheap i had not a sou and it was to his atelier that i was directed there i met cicely monet and basile it was our mutual poverty which created a union and it was the effect of those gatherings of ours which brought to notice the impressionist school individually we had neither the force nor the courage to promote the idea the school had as its foundation our friendships discussions and poverty and we struggled to uphold one another in eighteen seventy two bertha moret joined our group securing some funds wherewith we arranged a sale of our work at the hotel Trois. it created a furor an old habitue of the famous auction rooms helped us immeasurably by his condemnation he was one of those daily frequenters of the place who reviled in the kind of atmosphere one finds only in a salesroom he entered our salon and calling to a crony who was passing through the lobby said come and see the horrors the other entered and remarked protestingly but they are not so bad the old fellow was indignant they are disgusting and he hastened to gather sympathizers to his side two camps were formed and a veritable fracas ensued joined from time to time but the passers-by attendants were summoned to restore order and they were obliged to close the doors just about the time that peace was restored 
the sale of our work took place next day and our canvases sold for an average of twenty-five francs apiece yes but from that day on we had our supporters the evocation of these youthful and turbulent memories kindled the eyes of renoir which shone brilliantly with the retrospection in spite of his stricken limbs he seemed no longer infirm in his chair that aspect of him faded from me before the animation of his eyes what vivacity they gave off what intelligence he still possessed i then asked to see some of his paintings and he instructed his servant to accompany me she led the way to a bedroom in one corner of which the walls contained two rows of canvases without stretchers others were laid upon the eider-down cover of the bed often the same canvas contained three or four different studies and sometimes a fragment had been cut from a corner these paintings worth of twenty thirty and forty thousand francs were left hanging there like washing out to dry among them were many portraits in the light of the noonday sun his last works had not that bricky quality of colour often so disagreeable a mannerism which he had affected for several years his heads too seemed more distinguished this curious collection of pictures gave me the impression of a heap of precious stones i asked the servant how renoir painted then i place the brushes between his fingers she said and tie them with the cords and ribbons which you saw sometimes they will fall and i have to replace them but what is most surprising about m renoir is the sharpness of his eyes i have known him to call upon me to remove a bristle from his brush which had disengaged itself in the paint i look over the canvas carefully but without success and it is always monsieur who points it out to me this good woman has been in his service for thirteen years and was desolated not to be able to discuss art with the master for his distraction merely acting as his nurse she later conducted me to a little isolated studio in a corner of the garden and there showed me the canvas upon which renoir was working at the time his famous nude woman a well-studied back pose the stretcher on the easel in lieu of being held in place by a block was supported by a counterpoise which allowed renoir to raise or lower his canvas with the utmost ease i returned presently to the old painter and said what marvellous pictures the number of canvases you have produced is incredible during my life he said i have sold more than three thousand canvases it must be a great joy for you to realize how strong the influence of your school has been throughout the world its impress on the artistic mind has been so positive that it did not give people of other nations a chance to develop in a national way this is felt in america canada sweden norway and germany everywhere the spirit of the french school is felt everywhere even in germany a country where everything remains gothic exactly as in the middle ages its architecture still dates from that period then we spoke of degas and he said what a beast that degas was violent and bitter tongued all his friends grew to shun him in time i was one of the last to remain by him but even i did not hold out until the end it is incomprehensible that manet kind and gentle was always disputed while degas acrid and disagreeable intractable to a degree was hailed by every one from the very first by the general public the revolutionaries and the institute they feared him yes that was it i kept his friendship for a long time turning myself inside out to please him one day he said to me renoir i have an implacable enemy one not to be vanquished who is he i asked if you must know the old beast replied thumping his breast this enemy is myself i asked renoir if he would let me have one of his canvases but he was most reluctant saying for the present i am accumulating them i have not enough to leave my children in a year perhaps it will be different perhaps then but i will not sell them cheaply because of the dealers in modern art i will not hinder their commerce 
and furthermore i have an old debt of gratitude toward de Ruel, who was the only one to come to my rescue when i was hungry i spoke to him of a canvas i had remarked particularly some washerwomen beside a stream that canvas i said is surely the countryside between st raphael and monte carlo i admire with what truth you have painted the soil above the olive tree the trunk of which is raised so curiously from the little hillock of earth that olive tree replied renoir was beastly if you only knew how it harassed me a tree full of colour not at all grey its little leaves made me sweat a sudden gust of wind came and my tree changed all its tonalities the colour was not on the leaves but in the open spaces i know i am not a painter of nature but to come to grips with her amuses me yet a painter is not great until he knows nature landscapist that was at one time a term of contempt especially in the eighteenth century yet that period which i adore produced the greatest landscapists i am a painter of the eighteenth century i consider myself not only a descendant of watteau fragonard and hubert robert in my art but actually of that group watteau raphael giants cut off in the very flower of their youth and genius i tell you monsieur those who die young are gifted with an intelligence that doubles their efforts End of section nine Section ten of the dial, May nineteen twenty by various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Section ten Dublin Letter by Ernest Boyd. April nineteen twenty. Ten years ago in Dublin, it was safe to say that every young writer had the manuscript of a peasant play in his pocket unless by happy chance the document lay in the archives of the abbey theatre or was undergoing the erratic scrutiny of the abbey reading committee since august nineteen fourteen there has been a marked change in the trend of literary activity first came the spell of political writing inspired by the sharpening of the conflict between ireland and england jail journals and the narratives of Sinn fein prisoners of war followed by political and economic studies engaged the energies of the press censor whose blue pencil hacked its way through pages of manuscript with the schrecklichkeit inseparable from such undertakings since the armistice that functionary has gone abandoning us to the irresponsible efforts of the competent military authorities who have suppressed by dismantling the machinery every daily and weekly paper guilty of the heresy of nationalism we have to wait for the english papers to read matter which has been bayoneted out of the irish press for the raids on newspaper offices are always carried out by several carloads of soldiers in full trench equipment even a collection of speeches made by the carsons f e smiths and the like in their ulster rebellion campaign has been seized although bearing the imprimatur of the late censor the authorities believe that these incitements to armed revolt by cabinet ministers should not be allowed to encourage the growth of similar sentiments amongst the mere irish outside ulster an english edition of the booklet entitled the grammar of anarchy which has never been passed by any censor is sold without any interference from the authorities who are careful to limit their intimidation to irish editors and publishers whether as a result of these conditions or not there has been a noticeable tendency to use the novel rather than the political essay as a means of expressing the struggles hopes and aspirations of modern ireland the dramatic possibilities of the easter rising have irresistibly drawn the novelists to the thought of the fine story that could be written around it so far none has succeeded in the attempt to bring that dynamic and tragic experience into literature but in addition to some conventional fiction the stirring of the national being by Sinn fein 
has provided us with two novels of great documentary interest the clanking of chains by brinsley mcnamara and the gale by edward e lysant both published by messrs monsell of dublin mr lysot was a sort of unofficial sinn fein representative at the plunkett convention when mr lloyd george decided to keep the irish talking until america had come into the war he was the first to leave it being followed shortly afterwards by a e when these two sincere believers in the scheme discovered that the whole affair was a hoax he is the author of irish eclogues an original booklet of verse and has reversed all the traditions and conventions of the class to which he belongs by becoming a practical and successful farmer and a strong nationalist in spite of his having gone through the devitalizing mill of the best english school and university education his personality has survived the cult of good form that thoroughly british substitute for good brains in spite of its title the gael has nothing to do with that ultra-modern type of stage irishman who comes to dublin from one or other of the old english universities and with saffron kilt and cockney accent upholds the traditions of the gaelic state if mr lysett's con o'hickey had been one of that species he would probably have spent most of his time in town discussing grafted copies of current irish publications and pronouncing them worthless because they were not written in gaelic at times he would have sallied forth into some irish-speaking district where his bare knees would shock the pruderies of the unsophisticated and would have bullied native irish speakers into using that language instead of that con o'hickey decides to work rather than talk for ireland he had been educated at an english school and an irish imitation of an english university he possessed a small private income and was ripe for any form of useless employment but having worked as a farm labourer he has developed a love for the life of the soil and thinks of emigrating it is then that mr lysop discovers him just as it occurs to him that he might as well give his labours to his own country as to canada once conohickey has bought the estate at rothcarrig the author enters into the heart of his theme mr lysop describes with unaffected simplicity and great charm the life he knows best life as it is lived on the land he is not just a literary gent resting his tangled box on the bosom of nature the savour of earth and air the ardour of intense creative labour are in his pages what he calls in irish eclogues the joy of permanence but as the good work of building up a rural community develops it does not proceed unhindered there are many more than technical difficulties to be overcome and the portrayal of local types the delineation of political and social manners make the book a real microcosm of modern ireland pressure of events slowly brings con o'hickey to the point where he stumbles against the obstacles gross and subtle which alien administration and government have contrived in ireland for the thwarting and if necessary the destruction of all creative effort with the sagacity of long experience the british government recognizes in con o'hickey a force which is utterly incompatible with the safety of the realm that is the preservation of england's economic domination in ireland neglecting the opportunity for patriotic heroics mr lysa confines himself to a careful well authenticated analysis of the gradual process whereby this practical idealist is turned into that now familiar bogey a sinn feiner an atrocious sentence upon one of his men leaves con o'hickey with a blind rage in his heart and a row of dots marks the breaking off of this page of life in a sort of epilogue the author explains that the threat of conscription was the culminating point in o'hickey's orientation the deviation of the constructive impulse into the unavoidable political effort he becomes the leader of a contingent rebellion 
but being a nationalist he does not reach the british cabinet like carson but finds himself in jail his work is undone the continuity of his effort is effectively broken the reiterated and destructive negative of the english system in ireland once more attains its end the constructors are baffled impeded and if needs be destroyed mr lycett has told the story of what sinn fein is doing and he has revealed how sinn feiners are made as his book appeared the irish public learned that it was seditious to publish in ireland the evidence now being given by various experts before a commission which is holding an inquiry into the industrial resources of the country a most illuminating commentary upon the thesis of the gale nearly two years ago mr brinsley mcnamara published his first novel which i discussed in this place the valley of the squinting windows has since reached the american public and no doubt his new book the clanking of chains will follow having been stoned by the villagers of the place described in that earlier volume the author must have been prepared for another violent repudiation mr mcnamara continues to show us the reverse of the medal the epigraph of this new novel is mr yeats lines romantic ireland's dead and gone tis with o'leary in the grave the clanking of chains is the curious complement of the gale it shows the seamy side of irish nationalism that is not to say as perhaps the british propagandists would hope that he has written a melodramatic tale of sinn fein gunmen murdering policemen and plotting sinister schemes in conjunction with bolshevists and hohenzollerns what he has done is to challenge the comfortable and comforting convention which ireland likes to think is her likeness every nation has a popular conception of itself and the writer who upsets the current idealization risks unpopularity if not a definite charge of consorting with the hosts of darkness yet so far no public manifestations of anger has greeted the successor to the valley of the squinting windows the ballycullen of the clanking of chains is a remorseless exposure of the worst side of political and social life in our country towns in this community of opportunist and verbal patriots lives a rather futile idealist michael dempsey who dreams of heroic deeds but is reduced to despair by the brutal tragicomedy of life when it is safe and easy and profitable ballycullen is on the side of the angels but while men and women are fighting and dying and suffering the crowd is content to belittle the effort and to sneer at its supporters mr mcnamara shows how the new movement in irish nationalism is reacted upon by these people how they can touch nothing that they do not disfigure and destroy the theme is the eternal theme which ibsen handled in an enemy of the people the malevolent hostility of the crowd towards the individual the incurable loutishness of the average undeveloped human being if he has chosen to illustrate a universal subject by its particular application to ireland it is because the peculiar conditions of this country are singularly propitious to the existence of such creatures as clank their chains in his novel so many fine and romantic figures have been thrown into bold relief by the secular war of ireland for her national existence that the braggarts the opportunists and the mean exploiters have been provided with an impenetrable smoke-screen against all criticism the war has shown us everywhere how easy it is for the worst individuals to flourish under cover of the universal preoccupation with an outside enemy those who are inclined to accuse irish people of being morbidly susceptible to criticism of national faults should remember that ever since the loss of her independence ireland has been in a state of war with england and consequently indisposed to admit anything which seemed to play into the hands of the enemy after the exhibitions of this spirit all over the recently belligerent world irish people need no longer apologize for their intolerance it so happens that as the nation has become more conscious of its capacity for self-help 
as the Sinn fein spirit has grown there is a vastly larger measure of self-criticism than is commonly found in other countries whose national self-consciousness is alert mr brinsley mcnamara has been congratulated for the most part because of the power of his analysis of those elements in irish politics which have heretofore proved a source of grave danger now that a new generation and a new party have achieved power and responsibility in ireland the warning of this novel is not wasted while both novels are interesting contemporary documents it would be a mistake to salute them as masterpieces of literature mr lysett's pleases by the originality and freshness of the material and outlook of which the gale has sprung the author makes no pretensions to the title of the novelist proper although he writes well and easily mr mcnamara is a figure of more significance to those interested in the evolution of anglo-irish fiction like mr james joyce he has definitely broken with the ancient stereotypes which have served the irish novelist since the days of maria edgeworth he has some irritating tricks of style which he must overcome and his sense of form is still rather vague as the smudged ending of the clanking of chains reveals above all he is not sufficiently aloof from his creations to convey that sense of inevitability without which the realistic novel becomes as fatally artificial as the soothing romances of the gladdest of best sellers in fine although the novel has taken on a new lease of literary life in ireland the field is still without a really fine flower it may be that the recrudescence of fiction is simply the suppressed desire of sinn fein ireland to express and explain herself a political rather than a literary phenomenon if that is so another hope must be deferred for the need for self-expression grows more imperative with every suppression as these lines are written it is announced that all american papers have been seized at the post office by those ever so competent military authorities End of section 10. Section 11 of The Dial, May 1920, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Section 11. Mr. Mackenzie's Jest, by Gilbert Saltis. Poor Relations by Compton Mackenzie, 332 pages, Harper and Brothers, New York. Mr. Compton Mackenzie has placed himself in an extraordinary position for a man of honor. He is apparently being sued for breach of promise by at least half the eligible young women of his native scene with no correspondent named. The awkwardness of the situation is not all on Mr. Mackenzie's side, for there must be the pervasive feeling of having been a little too easily seduced in short mr mackenzie startled and delighted the critical world in nineteen twelve or so by writing a very remarkable book called carnival he had already published one work a novel predestined to be minor and he followed his first triumph with a very long account in two volumes of the childhood and adolescence of a boy who was destined to be a priest toward the end of these lively pages something alien crept in and although it was forgiven it caused a moment's apprehension this was in turn banished by the appearance of guy and pauline an interlude of surpassing loveliness after it a deluge of novels three in number but multitudinous in their faults and terrible in the announcement they bore that mr mackenzie had at last found his way in the world it was not the way of carnival and of guy and pauline it was the sorry way of the second half of sinister street what was felt as an aberration has become an attitude fixed merciless and distressing i do not wonder that some of his disappointed lovers have forced themselves to believe that he was always false alas that he should be false at all who was so fair 
it is a fit theme for lamentation but let those who lament be certain that they know how mr mackenzie has betrayed them above all it was with beauty with his creation of beauty and his love for the thing he created it was never irreproachable his two novels of beauty are full of lapses in taste and of artificial prettiness but it is impossible to deny them a fundamental honesty and what is more startling an effect of reality notable in carnival mr mackenzie painted each lovely color of his scene with apparently the hard pigment of life it was nobly imagined it has been well observed in the work of passing what had been observed through the fire of composition had been decently accomplished when he moved from the hard pavements of london to the moist airs of oxfordshire in guy and pauline mr mackenzie's observation was even finer certainly it was more subtle and it was concerned with less perishable stuff the poignancy of this novel to put it unkindly its subject is a girl's first love and disappointment is proof enough that it is psychologically true otherwise the tragedy must have made it absurd the other novels of mr mackenzie are a series of records minute often entertaining undeniably alive and accurate of the actions and emotions of several groups of young people they have all the qualities of good novels except creative strength and all the appearance of the spectacle of life except its emotional verity when mr mackenzie gave up the creation of beauty he suffered more than his readers for he sacrificed at the same altar the one thing which for him made life worth recording that shows in his new novel poor relations is a farce any number of children and adults pass through its pages all acting exactly as children and adults act their manners their cheap wit their meanness and hypocrisies are all set down a plot of quite exceptional banality and incidents of incredible age and vulgarity serve to display these lifelike wares trained animals could hardly respond so well and mechanical toys are not so versatile but life escapes jauntily in the story of a rich dramatist who flees from his greedy relatives to find i quote the jacket romance in london romance dear lord the gentleman marries a secretary whom h g wells would have been proud to give away at the registrar's what remains a mystery is the identity of the goddess at whose altar mr mackenzie laid down his precious gifts the creative imagination the love of beauty the deep sane comprehension of life he had at the beginning escaped neatly all the perils he had rejected the outworn antithesis of realism and romance his endowment his zeal his passion were abundant he seemed to be the only one of the young novelists of england who discerned the wanton loveliness of life under the dreary trappings of existence and to-day he is all trappings unmistakably gaudy dazzling in his quick changes still entertaining a master of every effect except the effect of creation a case could no doubt be made the mystery might be solved but there is an indelicacy in the process mr mackenzie must follow his inclination and it would be as well to utter him no reproaches but there are two who cannot reproach him and whom he has served badly in the cause of all that is decent in the art of the novel they may be called upon and placed before mr mackenzie one is his own creation the girl in carnival whose ineffable gaiety and impudence and loveliness were so soon made a mockery in a cheap series of adventures the other is the great master of the english novel who a year or two before he died chose mr mackenzie for his rare and special praise it would be easier to think lightly of mr mackenzie's failure if one did not have to remember what henry james said of him remembering that and remembering jenny pearl the brief story of mr mackenzie's career takes on some of the proportions of tragedy End of section eleven section twelve of the dial may nineteen twenty by various 
this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section twelve a social pioneer by harold j lasky the life of francis place seventeen seventy one to eighteen fifty four by graham wallace four hundred and fifteen pages alfred a knopf new york english social history is most largely the creation of the past thirty years the intimate life of working men and women was not regarded by the classic historians as a fundamental portion of the national record a brilliant chapter in macaulay statistics of births and deaths some notes on changes in the fashions of dress and houses it was with scrape such as these that the great victorians treated us for after all the ebb and flow of daily life makes little enough show in the pomp and circumstance of great events it is little enough of the glamour by which martial triumph is invested or of the splendid excitement which surrounds a great debate in the house of commons yet slowly we are coming to see that these are after all but the external trappings of the real drama they serve rather to conceal than to display the events by which the nation was most deeply stirred the great artist sees deeper and the novels of dickens and disraeli remain to tell us of an england which has with difficulty found its way into accredited history it is in the pages of palimpsests like sibyl that we glean some notion of why the castle of the peace of vienna had none of its splendid symbols for the common people or why the majesty of ricardo's name brought to them no echo of applause the main dependence of men like croker the scent and curls of genial fops like de Horsay, the ruthless magnificence of roues like lord hertford have turned now to dust and ashes those who awaken our enthusiasm are of different fibre we respond rather to the persistency of richard carlyle who made of a prison the temple of freedom our veneration is for men like thomas hepburn to whom the whole vista of modern trade unionism seems to have been revealed the prophets of the time are not peel or lord john russell or macaulay but men like william lovett with a burning zeal for popular education or robert owen who did not forget the tragedies of his childhood in his days of comfort it is to this new tradition that mr wallace's book belongs it is almost idle to praise it now for it has taken its place among the accepted masterpieces of english political biography it has indeed a special historical significance the meaning of which is only now emerging clearly into the light of day the main burden of its teaching was the need for research into the less obvious sources before a final judgment has passed upon historic figures before mr wallace wrote place was little more than a casual footnote in the politics of westminster now it is clear that the perspective of the time is better and more rightly seen within the mirror of his life than in those of men who stride more proudly across the stage he worked like a mole in the dim twilight world statesmen like gray and lord john russell would have barely known of his existence or if his name passed over their lips it would have been with some phrase that emphasized a doubt whether the influence of such humble men as place was was wise they still regarded politics as the prerogative of a leisured class they did not see that because it so deeply touched the intimate recesses of the worker's life his interest in it could he be given the means of influence was fundamental the worker as disraeli saw was nothing so much as a separate nation and they would have closed the gates of power to francis place because he did not like croker or creevy fawn his way to the bottom of the rich man's table but place was of a tougher fibre his life had known bitter hardship and he was one of the priceless men whom misfortune renders only more eager to mend the hardships of their fellows the friend of bentham and the mills the political master of joseph hume without exception the ablest political organizer in london he did not need friendships that would not have been offered upon an equal basis 
he is one of those rare instances in public life of men who devotedly serve the noblest of all causes without demanding recompense in personal reputation the history of modern trade unionism turns upon the fundamental reform he secured he gave life and substance to the decayed radicalism of england after its long somnolence during the napoleonic wars it was his intervention which staved off that wellington administration of eighteen thirty one which might well have proved the prelude to a disastrous revolution he was active in the movement for popular education he was one of the pioneers of chartism he contributed to political organization not a few of the chief technical instruments at its disposal wherever we meet him he is bluff careful far-seeing and nine times out of ten patently right he is capable of enthusiasm without being mastered by it he is tough without being hard determination never passes into obstinacy and withal his comments make clear that few men were so shrewd in their judgment of the great public characters of the time he did not like greville see them through the distorted mirror of social rumour he did not like macaulay allow party ties to sway his opinion peel brougham russell huskisson from them all he seems to strip the facade which statesmanship builds about its acolytes he goes straight to the inner motive which the declared purpose serves so often to conceal he is concerned only with the realization of right and the touchstone of his judgments is the help they render in actual effort to the causes he had at heart such is the figure that mr wallace paints for us it is difficult to overestimate the significance that attaches to his portrait he makes evident what professor dicey has shown us in the sphere of the law the almost overwhelming creativeness of benthamism that creed indeed came at a time fortunate for its principles the evils it came to deny were too glaringly obvious to be capable of effective defence but there has never been in english history a group of men who so passionately or so single-heartedly worked out the application of their principles to the events with which they had to deal benthamism it is not too much to say made democratic england possible it is easy now to see its faults its formulae are too simple for a complex world it did not realize the inability of the average man to make headway against a fate which is for most an inescapable and tragic one the power of combination did not sufficiently enter into its calculations yet not even the last word of criticism can conceal the creative destruction that it wrought it was a creative hope where the blind forces of the new industrialism seemed the progenitors of a new and bitter slavery nor did francis place fail to understand the obvious lessons of his effort he saw how powerful are the forces opposed to change liberalism in the simple sense of a well-meaning approval of advance never attracted him the liberalism for which he cared was either a concrete definiteness like that of bentham or else an unflagging pursuit of the minutiae of organization like that of joseph hume he knew that power is poison and that it erects about itself a system of protective ramparts which only persistent determination can overcome the lesson he drew from his experience was the simple one that the real path of progress is institutional organization petitions meetings great words and speeches left him cold it was the systematic if minute steps in which he saw the secret of advance natura nihil facet per saltum is the chief lesson the enthusiast has to learn but place knew well it is the lesson most difficult to teach nor was he handicapped by illusions as to the people not the least stumbling block in the way of democratic progress is the zeal of those who are satisfied that a popular instinct for right is all that is necessary to reform place believed in the popular capacity for self-government but he was not hindered by ignorance as to its difficulties he recognized that the vast majority of the working class does not find the centre of its interests in politics he knew that 
even if it did it lacked the education which made possible the mastery of technical detail he realized that facts are obstinate things which fail to render obedience to popular desire there is a lesson no student of the democratic process should neglect in his management of the repeal of the combination acts here is the expert at his best psychologically imaginative economically accurate armed cap a -pee in the unanswerable panoply of statistics fortified by serried masses of human experience in our own day mr justice brandeis in the famous brief in muller versus oregon mr bevan in the recent inquiry into docker's wages have shown us that scientific control of the facts will ultimately produce an unanswerable result the way is less easy than it seems and it is certainly far more difficult than the sudden projection into the event of badly organized mass action in which french labor seems to put its confidence the method of place is the slow and careful tabulation of every instrument of service the careful organization of resources the flinging of your power at a given point so that the danger of competing interest is removed the same grim statesmanship is seen in his hint to sir francis burdett at the preparations needed for a revolution it is shown in the technique by which wellington was overthrown in eighteen thirty one the management of a case is half the secret of success in efforts such as these they point to the need of studying the strategy of labor politics with the same infinite care for detail that is expended by a general staff upon a plan of campaign they involve the careful preparation by forehanded effort of each step to be taken they involve precise estimates of the effect such steps will have upon the public as also the effect and hostile analysis of those steps will mean they imply that every member of the organization has his allotted function and knows to a nicety the duties of his station above all they demand consideration of the element surprise it was in media such as these that place worked and his genius consists hardly less in the methods he used than in the results he achieved they are a perennial wellspring of education just at the point where a democracy is most likely to be ill-informed mr wallace himself has learned that lesson and it is hardly too much to say that his two subsequent books were an examination into the psychological foundations of the technique implicit in place's work it will one imagines be a task of no small difficulty for the future historian of english thought looking at mr wallace's three volumes to explain the exact bearing of his work he will not find as with professor bosanquet a considered philosophy of the state he will not find as with mr sidney webb an organized analysis of economic structure he will not discover as with mr cole a prophecy of our future almost perspiring in its enthusiasm yet the clue it may be suggested is a simple one what mr wallace has emphasized is the inadequacy of the previous formulae by which the complex facts of human association are explained fear as with hobbes consent as with locke the self-interest of the utilitarians the habit of sir henry maine these at the best are vaguely partial glimpses society it is clear is a vast effort at intellectual cooperation it is a cooperation hindered at every stage by individual passion and the absorption of some group in the quest of its self-interest what mr wallace has done is to drive us to the examination of the methods by which that cooperation can be best attained a society in which men were all as able and as altruistic as francis place would doubtless hardly need the rules he seeks to discover but we work with different data what we mainly have to search are the impulses of men in their social expression the discovery of the channels by which their satisfaction may be attained it is not an easy task a genius like bentham may escape the rule that a plan to be a plan must be put into readable form and the accident that his demont may not appear 
must be guarded against a committee like the british war cabinet may break down on a fundamental question because it has never considered the means by which expert testimony is best elicited a cabinet like mr wilson's may cease to function because the principle of its action has been centred in a mind that fails at a critical moment to have contact with it little by little mr wallace has forced the technique of social inquiry upon a new path he has made us adjust our ethics to the facts of human nature and our perspective is different because of the hints he has given but he has done more there are perhaps five or six living men who can disentangle the social history of england in the nineteenth century with the same knowledge and wisdom as mr wallace that has made him in a real sense the parent of what is rapidly becoming the most significant part of modern english historiography no country in the world to-day has a social history which surpasses in quality the history of trade unionism by mr and mrs webb the studies of english working-class life by the hammonds and the more specialized studies of which they are only the chiefest part what in the mass it has done is to make the left wing of english radicalism scientific in a sense to which no other party in english politics can make claim it has given to its ideas an historical perspective a realistic background and above all a knowledge of the slow fashion in which ideas must strive to make their way which are the very breath of hope for in politics the first condition of hope is the ability to be optimistic in the face of certain disillusion your enemies will defy your facts half-hearted friends will destroy your ideas by compromising with their opposite your followers will despair because you have not the firm outlines of utopia the certainty of progress lies in the ability to discount these things from the outset that is why the study of history is with all its limitations still the one sure path to political salvation and that it may be added is the one great lesson american students of politics can draw from mr wallace's life of place an english liberal who analyzes the american equivalent of his faith cannot help but find it a little bare and meagre it is negative rather than positive it has not been rooted in the hard facts of its historic environment it has not been nourished by continuous contact with that past from which it naturally springs i know of one book only mr crawley's promise of american life which has striven to interpret the prospects in terms of the traditions that control it i know of one other book mr lippman's preface to politics which has striven to analyze the proper method of inquiry the rest seems little more than facile pictures of immediate evil or else the translation of the critic's personal experience into the resplendent detail of a national program what they need is the living substance of american history it is indeed true in no light degree that those who have made american historiography have given them little enough of aid histories like mr rhodes are the material less of understanding than of edification american life cannot be interpreted from the comfortable angle of a banker's window but in other directions there is material of the first importance for all its dullness the vast tomes of von holst contain more wisdom on the problems of federal structure than is to be found in any other work the superb suggestiveness of professor turner the careful criticism of charles beard the older but still important work of hildreth these are the things the student must know if his work is to have the needed substance above all they must go back to their texts they must investigate in all their bearings the works of hamilton and calhoun they must learn to win the friendship of lesser men like john taylor it will be no easy task to hew from out these vast materials the principles of which american liberalism stands in need but there is no way to political wisdom save through the dirt and sweat of historical scholarship our safeguards of liberty are not to be known from a hasty impression of the daily press that is why the man who will do most for the study of american politics will be the man who impresses upon this generation the lesson englishmen 
have learned from graham wallace it will be a great day when his certain advent may be signalled end of section twelve section thirteen of the dial may nineteen twenty by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. section thirteen against nightingales by malcolm cowley picture show by siegfried sassoon fifty six pages e p dutton and company new york the war poems of siegfried sassoon ninety five pages william heinemann london eight years ago when the georgians first appeared as a group it seemed that they were discovering more strident harmonies subtler dissonances but with the publication of each new anthology the disappointment is cumulative every two years a volume bound in fresh brown boards printed on fresh paper but with the contents so familiar so delicately trite reaching with such skill to new heights of inanity out of all the group one metaphysician who slips between the boundaries of the unreal and the real one passionate consumptive one forthright satirist siegfried Sassoon, and the rest nightingales it is by their absorption with nightingales by their identification of themselves with the nightingale that one may recognize the georgians oh nightingale creature something more than a bird your trilled notes are almost the dominant tones of english poetry from chaucer's fowl that we were taught to speak of euphoniously as the nicktingal to the sentimental melodist of below wood we have been tormented by the monotony of your song your supremacy was threatened for a time by the red poppy school of war poets but once more you rule unchallenged o oh, feathered pedant o oh, banal rhapsodist confused by the tic-tac of iambics you leave me o oh, ecstatic boar homesick for the hoot howls and whippoorwills of an ohio dusk or for one moment of lucent quiet in which to forget all the nightingales that sang from chaucer to john drinkwater when a poet like siegfried sassoon tries in lumbering pentameters to talk about something else than nightingales and the trees and meadows which are their haunt when he goes back to dawn and swift instead of the elizabethan lyricists he has to struggle against a whole tradition of vapidity he is fighting whether or not consciously for the theory of poetry as a mature art as against the theory which would attach poetry definitely to the childhood of the race and the individual too much of contemporary verse expresses the emotions of a girl of twelve in words of one syllable it throbs too insistently and seems intended for recitation over a guitar or in accompaniment with the querulous allegro of an automatic piano work of the sort was confined for a long time to the popular magazines one accepted it without a murmur but when the georgians erected this throbbing naivete into a sacrosanct school they were striking at the fundamentals of their art except their premise and poetry takes rank as a medium of expression somewhere between the movies and fancy needlework the virtues of the georgians are manifold and for the most part negative they are not unmelodious not awkward and never never improper sassoon is an alien among them he started with one poetic virtue honesty and that was unqualifiedly positive it was not a promising equipment for the early days of nineteen fourteen he tried his hand at the usual echoes of keats and wordsworth his imitations always impressing one as being a little more ungainly than those of his contemporaries through them he was struggling to express his own ideas not the imaginings of his models but the fact was not apparent at the time sincerity is a cheap virtue in a contented world yet to-day sassoon is the most successful of his group one searches for what he writes reads it with respect turns to him first in the biennial anthology 
one makes all sorts of qualifications and yet he remains a great poet as poets go in these days he arrived at this position fortuitously perhaps he will continue in it there is a certain momentum in success one regrets that the collection of his war poems is not arranged chronologically with separate dates for beginning and middle and end for one thing such an arrangement would determine whether he wrote before Barbus or afterwards probably les fous and the old huntsman were in process of composition at the same time it is certain at any rate that he only said that what whole regiments were thinking to do that is a trick that may be learned like any other trick his early war poems include not one that could not have been better written by julian grenfell or robert graves or half a dozen other men however they did not choose to lead the way the honors of the pioneer remained for sassoon following him it was to be expected that others would express the same ideas and one was not disappointed they marched forward in platoons the wilfred owens the john mccloyds the frederick mannings the richard aldingtons the herbert reeds the osbert and edith sitwells even robert nichols and, and robert graves began to express the disillusionment of a uniform in the face of all this superior talent one waited vainly for the eclipse of sassoon while they spurted brilliantly he marched on a bit heavy-footed to be sure but still with his eyes on the goal there is a solidity about his verse which the others lacked it enabled him to remain the leader of a movement for which he had acted as scout if Heinemann had attempted a chronological arrangement of his poems it would show the steady development of a mind there was a time when sasson was as much obsessed as any by the glamour of brass buttons he trumpeted the glory of battle but even from his loudest trombone notes the do si do of patriotism is strangely lacking later came the great disillusion the poems that resulted from it are too familiar now for a long discussion except this that the verdict of many well-intentioned critics to the contrary they are not delicately ironical the same gentleman would probably speak of lynching bees as one of the delicate ironies of american civilization sasson lacks the masked sting of pope or voltaire he is a man with a bludgeon run amok in a mad world the end of the war found him ludicrously unprepared for three years he had been leading the way to the promised land of peace but now that he had arrived in canaan and the amalekites were dispersed he was left without an occupation still making vain gestures at imaginary opponents a few months passed he found himself ridiculously alone and became silent he recalled the war days to his mind perhaps in spite of himself a little regretfully and asked his countrymen have you forgotten yet for the world's events have rumbled on since those gagged days like like traffic checked a while at the crossing of city ways and the haunted gap in your mind has filled with thoughts that flow like clouds in the lit heavens of life and you're a man reprieved to go taking your peaceful share of time with joy to spare but the past is just the same and war's a bloody game have you forgotten yet look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget with that poem he delivered his own valedictory and now he turned back to the old subjects but without the zest of antebellum days he philosophized on life deciding that it was just the pictures dancing on the screen of a picture show he assured a childless woman that he understood her since it is sassoon speaking one decides that he really believes these commonplaces this fact however does not give them the lustre of originality what position is he preparing for himself in the new civilization certainly his sincerity has its value elsewhere than on the battlefield even in a world at peace there are common thoughts waiting for some one bold enough to express them and there are abuses that stink to heaven as much as the corpses along the bapaume road 
if he discovers them he will write about them awkwardly but directly and once more the nightingales will tune their throats for a new song while he was splashing through the iambic mud of flanders sassoon acquired somehow or other the art of writing poetry one makes note of the fact when reckoning up the chances in his favour the value of some of his later war verse depends not at all on any polemic vigour perhaps his best lines are in a poem he calls concert party egyptian base camp jaded and gay the ladies sing and the chap in brown tilts his grey hat jaunty and lean and pale he rattles the keys some actor bloke from town god send you home and then a long long trail i hear you calling me and dixieland sing slowly now the chorus one by one we hear them drink them till the concert's done silent i watch the shadowy mass of soldiers stand silent they drift away over the glimmering sand to analyze that stanza completely to explain the shifting meters the dragging in of extraneous prosaic details the alternation of direction known technically as change of pace is to understand most of the new movement in poetry from the parnassians to the unanimists if sassoon can utilize that knowledge in his civilian verse he is well on the way to a new success but first he must demobilize his intellect have pity on the poets of this war they have been feasted adored told that they were the representatives of the second renaissance since then eighteen months of peace have left them gasping in the face of a disillusionment worse than the boredom of the trenches let them rest for a time in quiet if they are not bleached too soon by the calcium of lecture tours they may recover themselves till then have pity on them End of section thirteen section fourteen of the dial may nineteen twenty by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. section fourteen a novelist's background by robert morse lovett letters of anton chekhov to his family and friends translated by constance garnett four hundred and sixteen pages macmillan company new york one approaches Chekhov's letters after reading the introduction with high anticipations. He was the son of a serf who had bought his freedom and achieved considerable prosperity as a merchant in Taganrog. When Anton was sixteen, he had to witness his father's failure, the sale of the household possessions, and the drifting away of the family to Moscow, leaving him alone to support himself at school. The intensity of the family interest in Chekhov's life appears in the fact that in his later prosperity he made his father mother and sister share his home and the relief of a second interest is shown by the fact that he found consolation for this early separation in the high school girls of taganrog the mysteries of love i fathomed at the age of thirteen he wrote later one divines an exclusively russian experience in these early days but of anything so generic as the exuberant brutality of gorky's family life the letters contain no trace or of the ecstasy and sorrow of youthful love chekhov took his degree in medicine in the university of moscow during the years when the nihilist movement was absorbing the russian intellectuals but of revolutionary ardor or the passion for martyrdom there is nothing he won early notice by his stories in the Novoi and his first play ivanov was a great controversial success he enjoyed his fame the stir and excitement of society which it drew about him the poignant personal relations which it opened to him the whole experience made more intense by the tuberculosis which already had shown itself one is reminded of the similar career which the youthful stevenson was leading in these same years but for a temperamental reaction upon it one looks in vain in chekhov's letters as stevenson crossed the plains of america chekhov crossed siberia to examine the most remote of the penal settlements on the island of sahalin 
he travelled by horse and boat and spent three months in sahalan making a complete social survey of the island his zeal found further expression in the organization of famine relief and in the fight against the cholera epidemic into which his medical training brought him but no note of social enthusiasm which could explain these sacrifices appears in the letters his last years were full of variety and crisis the first production of the seagull in eighteen ninety six was a failure followed by a complete reversal of the popular verdict and a general revival of chekhov's plays by the art theatre in moscow he married olga nipper one of the leading actresses of the company in nineteen o one the struggle between fame and love and death went on with increasing violence the cherry orchard in which chekhov's dramatic method reached its highest fulfilment was produced in january nineteen o four the twenty-fifth anniversary of his commencing author with homage from all russia six months later he died it may be said then that the letters of chekhov are at first sight disappointing they corroborate only faintly and unemphatically the life so vivid in outline either they have been subjected to a drastic process of selection and expurgation or they represent the reduction of experience to an even neutral tone of objective observation of detachment almost of indifference both explanations are doubtless in a measure true the letters to olga nipper for example if any would reveal chekhov as a man of passion and sorrow and of these but few appear but on the whole and with chekhov's stories and plays before us we must incline to the latter theory among letter writers he belongs to the school of prosper merimee rather than stevenson the few letters of mademoiselle nipper which have been included recall in their exquisite lightness and playful charm the letters a on Inconnu. but whereas the attitude of merimee was a studied and disciplined pose an artistic restraint defying passion that of chekhov was natural unschooled inevitable he recognized his lack of emphasis in life and in art as a limitation a sort of mediocrity life is short he wrote to suvarin and chekhov from whom you are expecting an answer would like it to flash by brilliantly and with dash he would go to prince's island to constantinople and again to india and sahalan but in the first place he is not free he has a respectable family who need his protection in the second he has a large dose of cowardice looking toward the future i call nothing but cowardice how the same sort of inhibition affected his art appears in another letter to the same critic who reproached him for leaving his story the party a mere bozzetto i let myself go at the beginning and write with an easy mind but by the time i get to the middle i begin to grow timid and to fear that my story will be too long i have to remember that the severny biestinik has not much money and that i am one of their expensive contributors this is why the beginning of my stories is always very promising and looks as though i was starting on a novel the middle is huddled and timid and the end is as in a short sketch like fireworks the most important service which the letters of a writer of fiction can render is to show us how his experience of life entered into his work became the material of his art from this point of view the letters of chekhov are most revealing chekhov is the typical realist of russian life as maupassant is of french his work consists of an enormous number of cases fully observed and amply annotated how copiously these cases came to him may be seen by a comparison of his stories chronologically arranged with the events of his life on a journey to Taganro, he wrote we talked of railways the inspector told us how the sevastopol railway stole three hundred carriages from the azov line and painted them in its own color an incident which furnished the germ of the story cold blood and in the same letter he wrote at an upper window at the far end of the station sits a young girl or a married lady goodness knows which in a white blouse beautiful and languid i look at her she looks at me etc which eventuated in two beauties 
he worked up such suggestions with the aid both of his own experience and of imagination his experience transferred to his characters gave them being his imagination projected them on ways far beyond the meagre frame of actual life in which he saw them in the step it is clear that he is relying chiefly on experience the story is merely the steady unflinching narrative of a boy's journey day and night with the wagons which carried the wool to the market of his intercourse with the drivers and observation of the landscape vast unyielding sinister like hardy's edgeton heath in a dreary story on the contrary it is imagination that carries the concept of the superannuated professor into a series of situations of grotesque futility of another masterpiece the grasshopper chakoff records with glee that it nearly precipitated a libel suit so closely had his imagination paralleled the course of an actual development his trip across siberia was fruitful in providing both cases and experience with which to enliven them the hardships of horse travel in the cold and wet of a backward spring with streams overflowing and mud understreaming the vast meaningless face of nature the abject figures of men sunk in distance and blurred in desolation give to the letters the poignancy of his siberian stories undoubtedly chekhov's profession was a cardinal fact in his career in the first place it kept him from becoming seclusive in his art his stories are a natural and healthy by-product medicine is my lawful wife and literature is my mistress he wrote when i get tired of one i spend the night with the other though it's disorderly it's not so dull and neither of them loses anything from my infidelity if i did not have my medical work i doubt if i could have given my leisure and my spare thoughts to literature there is no discipline in me but more essentially than this the practice of medicine determined both his material and his method the number of his stories which deal with sickness and death is very large and in these the objective experience of the physician is completed and intensified by the subjective experience of illness itself chekhov was both observer and sufferer it speaks much for his generally buoyant and healthy nature that in his work the objective element so distinctly predominates moreover contact with science made chekhov an analyst and a realist he was of the school of zola which devoted itself to realism in the name of science and he looked with scorn on such beginnings of the crusade against scientific materialism as appear in bourget's les disciples forgive me he wrote but i can't understand such crusades whom is the crusade against and what is its object in the first place the materialistic movement is not a school or tendency in the narrow journalistic sense it is not something passing or accidental it is necessary inevitable and beyond the power of man they seek for truth in matter where there is nowhere else to seek for it since they see hear and sense matter alone of necessity they can only seek for truth where their microscopes lancets and knives are of use to them outside matter there is neither knowledge nor experience and consequently there is no truth holding this philosophy of literature chekhov made it his aim to come as close as possible to his subject matter theories of art he abhorred as inhibiting interrupting this immediate contact of the word art i am terrified as merchants wives are terrified of brimstone all conversations about what is artistic only weary me and seem to me like a continuation of the scholastic disputations with which people wearied themselves in the middle ages accordingly he wrote with careless haste and negligent ease i don't remember a single story over which i have spent more than twenty-four hours and the huntsman which you liked i wrote in the bathing shed i write my stories as reporters write their notes about fires mechanically half unconsciously taking no thought of the reader or myself he apologized for this haste i do not write very much he urged extenuatingly not more than two or three short stories weekly after the first failure of the seagull he wrote when i got home i took a dose of castor oil 
and had a cold bath and now i am ready to write another play the first characteristic of his work is its copiousness he was not the sparing artist like flaubert but the lavish master of life like balzac and therefore his work is more impressive in its mass than in its detail one continuous source of interest in chekhov's letters is supplied by his opinions of his contemporaries these are invariably consistent with his practice as analytical realist goncharov he began by admiring but later dismissed as second-rate chiefly on the ground that his chief character oblomov is exaggerated and overemphasized throughout a novel instead of being the hero of a mere story dostoevsky he thought long and indiscreet over pretentious turgenev he liked in parts bazarov's illness in fathers and children is so powerfully done that i felt ill and had a sensation as though i had caught the infection from him but the girls and women he thought insufferable in their artificiality and falsity all the lionesses in fact fiery alluring insatiable creatures forever craving for something are all nonsensical when one thinks of tolstoy's anna karenin all these young ladies of turgenev's with their seductive shoulders fade away into nothing for tolstoy he had personal love and personal loyalty as to the leader and master of russian literature toward two younger contemporaries andreyev and gorky his attitude is significant andreyev's practice of massing his material in support of a predetermined theme he regarded with suspicion andreyev's thought is something pretentious difficult to understand and apparently no good but it is worked out with talent andreyev has no simplicity and his talent reminds me of an artificial nightingale gorky he regarded with the indulgent favor of a master for a promising pupil he wrote to him as flaubert to maupassant and enforcing the same lesson you are an artist you are plastic that is when you describe a thing you see it and you touch it with your hands he did not hesitate to admonish his pupil for false rhetoric lack of restraint and overemphasis your imagination is quick to seize and to hold but it is like a big oven which is not provided with fuel enough you present two or three figures in a story but these figures stand apart outside the mass one sees that these figures are living in your imagination but only these figures the mass is not grasped but a few days later he added twenty-six men and a girl is a good story there is strong feeling of environment one smells the hot rolls of his own work chekhov was lightly soundly critical he recognized that in his rapid handling of his material he missed many opportunities fell short of many achievements you say that the hero of my party is a character worth developing good lord i am not a senseless brute you know i understand that i understand that i cut the throats of my characters and spoil them and that i waste good material this will stand as a final criticism of chekhov's work it is followed by the passage quoted above in which he speaks of his stories as beginning like novels and ending like sketches he lacked the courage of the novelist he lacked also the sustained imagination he conceived his characters with extraordinary deftness as doing and saying a great number of plausible things he objectified them fully but he failed to pluck out the heart of their mystery if mystery they have no better example of this brilliant plausibility in detail leading no whither is the story referred to the party chekhov saw his characters but not to the end at times he displays a clairvoyance that results in a generalization of great pith and moment he sees in the devotion of his daughters proof that tolstoy is a great moral force for daughters are like sparrows you don't catch them with empty chaff a man can deceive his fiancee or his mistress as much as he likes and in the eyes of a woman he loves an ass may pass for a philosopher but a daughter is a different matter what a thing one exclaims for a novel or a play but chekhov had not the patience to collect and arrange material for the development of a theme and after all he distrusted the method in his own plays he worked from his characters to achieve the vague and show it centrifugal quality of life 
not the neat logical precision of the dramatist's art how far even a microscopic study of his text leaves us from realizing the fullness of his intention appears from the gloss which he furnished souverain of his ivanoff it is as needful to the understanding of the play as a programme to strauss's tone poems eagerly he protested ivanoff and levov appear to my imagination to be living people i tell you honestly in all conscience these men were born in my head not by accident not out of sea-foam or preconceived intellectual ideas they are the result of observing and studying life they stand in my brain and i feel that i have not falsified the truth nor exaggerated it a jot in the end he confessed if on paper they have not come out clear and living the fault is not in them but in me for not being able to express my thoughts it shows it is too early for me to begin writing plays perhaps it was still too early when he wrote the seagull and the cherry orchard something may be conceded to immaturity when it is remembered that ibsen whom he much admired was thirty years older when he wrote his prose plays but more must be attributed to the quality of the russian life and character which he depicted ibsen had before him his stiff norwegians in their rigid social frame awaiting only their labels chekhov had the vagrant fluctuating volatile souls of russia in a setting of premature civilization already struck through with decay what wonder that the hand of the dyer became subdued to the material in which he worked he recognized the fact with a note of prophecy in one of the few lyric passages in his letters which he permitted himself our society is exhausted hatred has turned it as rank and rotten as grass in a bog and it has a longing for something fresh free light a desperate longing End of section fourteen section fifteen of the dial may nineteen twenty by various this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard section fifteen one of our sun gods by james oppenheim walt whitman the man and his work by leon basilger translated from the french by ellen fitzgerald three hundred and fifty five pages doubleday page and company new york from the sophisticated standpoint of analytic psychology it is hard to know what to say about this life by basilger if i put myself in a more naive attitude then i get the emotional echoes of the days when i too saw walt as a cosmos i am charmed and moved i feel that basilger has built a staunch and beautiful shrine for worship that he has added another testament to the new testament of the modern founder some of the rhapsodic verite of jean christophe is in this book and this lambent length lies over the facts of walt's life so that the start is clear sunrise and in the conclusion there is splendor of ended day floating and filling me walt marches into his own in europe through this book and perhaps may begin to march through it to his own in america i am stimulated and must pull down my leaves of grass again and see whether a year has made any difference it has not basilger grows a little dim his was sunrise seen in a mirror but here i am out in the sunrise itself dazzling and tremendous how quick the sunrise would kill me if i could not now and always send sunrise out of me we also ascend dazzling and tremendous as the sun we found our own oh my soul in the calm and cool of the daybreak where is there another song in the world like song of myself to my mind walt's very greatest as it was presumably his first it is really the discovery of a new continent and in the morning of time everything is at first hand and seen sparkling dawn is so breathless that the young god who walks abroad in it is amazed at the hair on the back of his hand why should a basilger celebrate walt when walt did it so much better himself i celebrate myself prodigiously for i and the world and the sunrise in it and launch forward a new race of heroes 
i cast an intellectual eye on the pages they bear up even under that strain like nietzsche walt is ahead of the scientists and intuitively flashes many of our new attitudes he fills out the void left by the new testament the void of laughter and the animal man and the modern love of materials and the open earth he has fought free of the ancient mystic's domination by the unconscious the revelation i believe in you my soul the other i am must not abase itself to you and you must not be abased to the other this equality with the god hinges on an equality with men and he is mystical without fear of the supernatural nor strangely un-american is he afraid of the feminine in himself the brooding mother who would give a new birth to his nation the tender love which finally changes the rough of manhattan into the good gray poet of camden if all this is true why do i make any reservations why do i wish that instead of basalge we had some impersonal psychologist to revalue the bard for us the answer is partly in these lines know you solely to drop in the earth the germs of a greater religion the following chants each for its kind i sing it is the feeling that walt stands directly in the line of inheritance with gautama buddha jesus christ mohammed and zarathustra nietzsche stood there also he is the last of the great revealers the great teachers and this may happen because he comes just before that moment when modern psychology makes new mass religions and world revelations forever impossible we may no longer take a great book as our guide to life and feel that our god walks beside us when we mouth the immortal lines what we learn of our god is through analysis of symbols and authority is rooted firmly within us as individuals my truth is not your truth nor yours mine had walt lived in the middle ages we should have had the imitation of walt just as we had the imitation of christ and it is here that i for one part company with basalge benz buck edward carpenter and horace Trabell. they are careful it is true to assert that each must find what walt found and each in his own way but actually one feels the following in the footsteps which is so repugnant to our modern conscience if walt practices a white magic upon us it behooves us to overcome and slay him like any terrible father lest we blunt ourselves with trying to play at another to wear his mask instead of revealing our own faces unilluminated as they are there is not the same problem with nietzsche somehow behind zarathustra there lurks merely a very human and sick scholar who after hard intellectual struggle was inundated by the unconscious is the cause of the difference inherent in the difference between nineteenth-century europe and nineteenth-century america i have talked of this with van wick brooks who knows more about it than most of us and he points out how isolated our great and near great have been how free from the critical insight of their fellow men and hence how quickly they turned into myths washington barnum young mrs eddy walt whitman if a nation cannot feel common background without a special mythology then we have gone the usual path and out of necessity created our heroes and gods and surely walt whitman played into this myth-making tendency inviting all america his own and that of the future to hang about his neck this criticism would have little point if it were not for the fact that our age of heroes and of gods has passed and a sterner and more civilized age dawns upon us our great task to-day is to overcome and demolish the american tradition to replace pioneer optimism and our naive belief in our inherent superiority by-products of continent conquest by a new conquest of the self the homeric age is over the age of aeschylean tragedy has begun it is a time for searching of our spirits for catharsis we are discovering the abyss beneath us our leaders to-day must be those who thus far have almost been inarticulate in america they are in nature quite the opposite of abraham lincoln and walt whitman they stem from roskolnikov hamlet and dante 
hitherto the pioneer horde has trampled them down or converted them into sorry opposites of themselves and it is just the sensitive ones who are most attracted by the sunrise affirmations of whitman they need to see their sun-god as a man it is for such reasons that it seems to me that Basalge is a bit belated it is no reflection on walt the great bard truly one of the great world poets it is a need in ourselves which may be satisfied only by clear analysis and detached evaluating End of section fifteen section sixteen of the dial may nineteen twenty this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section sixteen one woman composer by pitts sanborn impressions that remained memories by ethel smythe in two volumes illustrated five hundred and eighty five pages longman's green and company new york ethel smythe with no literary pretension and an unabashedly colloquial sometimes a slipshod style possesses and employs the life-giving faculty of the born writer of memoirs the figures that people her pages seem as real to the reader as they must be to her an incident or anecdote is bitten in with the sureness the sharpness the brevity of a master etcher and it is all by the by the memoirs are documented on a mass of correspondence from the protagonists yet the effect of the book as a whole is just sufficiently haphazard what the french call de cossu and therein is the strength of the book there is no formal setting of stages and drilling of the dramatis personae rather what is given has the quality of being lived before our eyes ethel smythe was born into an english country family april twenty third eighteen fifty eight she was musical and a tomboy her father a general in the army who spent a part of his life in india seems to have been a worthy gentleman of the good conservative county tradition ethel began shocking him early i think i am the only one of the six miss smythes who has ever been really thrashed and continued to shock him until paternal resignation became the better part of military valour of course the general did not approve of a musical career for young ladies but ultimately he succumbed to filial strength and strategy her mother was a rare woman beautiful temperamental gay witty not always tactful and musical behind the immediate family group there were five other daughters and two sons hovers the elusive and fascinating figure of bonnie maman this was the maternal grandmother who married on second an adventurer whom she adored lived in paris and corresponded in an interesting manner with interesting members of the opposite sex and indeed strayed so far from the strict sect of county propriety that her residence abroad was an obvious relief to the majority of her family in england this very giddy skeleton in a french closet was hushed up before her grandchildren as a sort of family disgrace but miss smythe after reading some of her letters in later years came to the conclusion that poor bonamamon gifted warm-hearted impulsive and thoroughly injudicious would have been her favourite relation the reader would fain know more of the beguiling bonamamon and her escapades and certainly the heredity indicated from mother and grandmother is one more argument for the validity of the theory that from out of some maternal reservoir of talent comes the endowment which makes a given number of a given race stand apart from and above the other members it was one of a series of more or less temporary and unhappy governesses that passed in and out of the smythe household of romping children who decided ethel's future course when i was twelve a new victim arrived who had studied music at the leipzig conservatorium then in the heyday of its reputation in england for the first time i heard classical music and a new world opened up before me i then and there conceived the plan carried out seven years later of studying at leipzig and giving up my life to music no one in the family took this intention 
seriously but it was a decision cast in iron the summer of eighteen seventy seven found miss smythe having surmounted all obstacles of tradition and maternal objection actually in the leipzig of her dreams it should be pointed out she says that the scene of that golden time was nothing less than a lingering bit of the dear old german of hein and goethe doomed presently to vanish under the stress of imperialism chapters follow on leipzig the quaintness of the town the groups into which its provincial society was sharply divided miss smythe being a lawless english girl was allowed by each group to frequent the others the notable figures of each group the conservatorium the gewandhaus concerts the extreme musical conservatism and the atmosphere of a provincial community that was sincere and for all its teapot tempests restful chapters often as remarkable for the vivid turning of a phrase as for the spontaneous eloquence of a profound sympathy and affection miss smythe soon outgrew the conservatorium the glorious part was the rest of the music life the concerts and the opera one may judge the classical conservatism of musical leipzig from the fact that though in other towns the custom of playing excerpts from wagner at concerts had been started such a thing was taboo within the sacred walls of the gewandhaus not even the overtures to his operas were tolerated and i remember an all but successful attempt to bar the siegfried idol this quite orthodox concert piece was so ill-received several of the permanent subscribers staying away to mark their indignation that the experiment was not repeated the great frau livia Freit, one of the dominant figures in music and fashion even boasted that she had never listened to a wagner opera because she wished to keep herself musically pure the glories of the opera were for miss smythe a wild english girl but not for the brahmins of leipzig though exception was made of course in favour of mozart and fidelio my group considered opera a negligible form of art probably because brahms had wisely avoided a field in which he would not have shown and of which the enemy wagner was in possession besides this the golden age of leipzig had been orchestral and oratorial and both musicians and concert public were suspicious of music drama the old families who had been rooted in their gewandos seats from time immemorial seldom hired boxes at the opera i used to go and hear carmen still my favourite opera whenever i had a chance and was indignant at herzogenberg's patronising remark that bizet was no doubt ein Gleichen, a little genius but in that school bizet chopin and all the great who talk tragedy with a smile on their lips who dart into the depths and come up again instantly like divers who in fact decline to wallow in the immensities all these were habitually spoken of as small people as a commentary on miss smythe's preference for carmen it is worth recalling that bizet's opera was at one time a positive fad with no less a classicist than brahms himself brahms the father and miss brahms but there is no hint in the memoirs that ethel smythe knew of the foster paternal predilection here enter the three l's of miss smythe's destiny in whatever set i might happen to find myself three names were constantly on all lips uttered with respect admiration or devotion as the case might be hitherto for various reasons i had met none of these evidently remarkable personalities then suddenly fate made good and in the case of a single week livia frey lily vaught and elizabeth von herzogenberg swam into my orbit frau frey has already been mentioned lily vaught was mendelssohn's youngest daughter the only absolutely normal and satisfactory specimen i have ever met of a much to be pitied genus the children of celebrated personalities frau frey was older than the other two i used to note the beauty in her face and voice when she spoke of mendelssohn who with his wife had been of her most intimate friends a world that since then had begotten brahms not to speak of wagner was growing contemptuous of its former idol and she was aware of the fact 
but did not consider it necessary even to discuss the matter no insistence on his merit no apology just the old love and faith i thought this attitude wonderful but to carry it through you had to beat livia of the light holding sapphire eyes elizabeth von herzogenberg liesel wife of heinrich von herzogenberg the only aristocrat in town who was also a good composer was destined to be the dominant figure in miss smythe's life though the friendship was violently and permanently interrupted through it seems miss smythe's relation to frau von herzog genberg's sister and brother-in-law julia and henry brewster but almost from their first meeting miss smythe appropriated the herzogenberg couple and not long afterwards heinrich von herzogenberg took her under his wing as a pupil thus rescuing her from the forcible instruction of the conservatorium it was inevitable that through the herzogenbergs miss smythe brahms should meet brahms himself early in eighteen seventy nine i think some time in january brahms came to leipzig to conduct his violin concerto played of course by joachim from the very first i had worshipped brahms music as i do some of it now since was predisposed to admire the man but without exactly disliking him his personality neither impressed nor attracted me and i never could understand why the faithful had such an exalted opinion of his intellect rather taciturn and jerky as a rule and notoriously difficult to carry on a conversation with after meals his mind and tongue unstiffened and then under the stimulus of countless cups of very strong black coffee he was ready to discuss literature art politics morals or anything under the sun on such occasions though he never said anything stupid i cannot recall hearing him say anything very striking and when his latest pronouncement on bismarck poetry or even music was ecstatically handed round it generally seemed to me that what any one might have said and now comes the secret of the great gulf fixed between the future militant and her musical idol i think what chiefly angered me was his views on women which after all were the views prevalent in germany only i had not realized the fact having imagined mein mann sagt was a local peculiarity brahms as artist and bachelor was free to adopt what may be called the poetical variant of the kinder kirche kutsche axiom namely that women are playthings he made one or two exceptions as such men will and chief among these was Lysel, to whom his attitude was perfect reverential admiring and affectionate without a tinge of amorousness to see him with lily Vonk, frau schumann and her daughters or other links with his great predecessors was to see him at his best so gentle and respectful was his bearing in fact to frau schumann he behaved as might a particularly delightful old-world son i remember a most funny conversation between them as to why the theme of his d major piano variations had what she called an unnecessary bar tacked on this being one of the supreme touches in that wonderful soaring tune she argued the point lovingly but as ever with some heat and i thought him divinely patient i like best to think of brahms at the piano playing his own compositions or bach's mighty organ fugues sometimes accompanying himself with a sort of muffled roar as of titans stirred to sympathy in the bowels of the earth the veins in his forehead stood out his wonderful bright blue eyes became veiled and he seemed the incarnation of the restrained power in which his own work is forged for his playing was never noisy and when lifting a submerged theme out of a tangle of music he used jokingly to ask us to admire the gentle sonority of his tenor thumb one of his finest characteristics was his attitude towards the great dead in his own art he knew his own worth what great creator does not but in his heart he was one of the most profoundly modest men i ever met and to hear himself classed with such as beethoven and bach to hear his c minor symphony called the tenth symphony jarred and outraged him once when he turned up to rehearse some work of his reinecke had not yet finished rehearsing one of mozart's symphonies i forget which 
and after the slow movement he murmured something to lazel that i did not catch she afterwards told me he had said i'd give all my stuff crumb to have written that one andante brahms remained the musical idol though he never became the close personal friend but in miss smythe's pages are clearly etched glimpses of other famous musicians the joachims touched in the case of joachim himself with a delicious malice the rontgens rubinstein henschel greg tchaikovsky who bade miss smythe cultivate the art of orchestration scorned in brahms written leipzig where the matter was held sacred and the manner might go hang the ruthless mahler nikish the lady killer and even the much younger fritz kreisler there is a tragic anecdote of mahler and the demoniacal charm he possessed for women in spite of his ugliness i felt this even when i saw him last it was in vienna in nineteen o seven worn out exasperated prematurely aged wrestling with the Hapsburgs, as personified by the intendant of the opera house he had made the first in the world he was far and away the finest conductor i ever knew with the most all-embracing musical instinct and it is one of the small tragedies of my life that just when he was considering the question of producing the wreckers at vienna they drove him from office when he was gone his enemies regretted their action but the ideal of art he sent his passionate refusal to abate one jot or tittle of his artistic demands the magnitude and purity of his vision these are things that start a tradition and linger after sunset at the time i am speaking of in leipzig i saw but little of him and we didn't get on i was too young and raw then to appreciate this grim personality intercourse with whom was like handling a bomb cased in razor edges miss smythe makes no allusion to his later experiences in new york the temptation to quote is so strong that unless one resolutely reigns in one would find oneself quoting the whole of the two volumes they are a series of shrewd lively evocative views of men and women big personalities for miss smythe though obviously no snob in the vulgar fashion does not waste time unnecessarily on little ones for the good reason that they do not interest her and man lives here on earth but once the big ones are there to be had for those who in their turn are big enough to capture them this book is a rich and irresistibly vivid panorama the reader has the pleasure of it that he has of a portrait gallery whose subjects interesting in themselves are delineated with comprehension and an unerring instinct of reproduction further from the wealth of indications offered he may construe the forthright character of miss smythe the work of construing i do not mean to attempt unto the reader that which is the reader's and then much of the book has to do with personal adventures of the author which the reader will read but on which i do not even touch there is for instance the highly diverting interlude of her brief engagement to no less a personage than willie wilde but through most of the two volumes runs the recurrent theme of lysel less a le motif than an idée fixe and it is her death that determines the end of the story in frankness miss smythe rivals that master of reminiscence mr george moore but unlike mr moore she never plays the enfant terrible about herself she is apparently willing to tell anything but her sense of mime and tone is keen and definite where others are involved too intimately as in the case of the henry brewsters she makes explicit her reserve read the book how you will for its evocation of other places and times for the light it throws on men and women of genuine consequence and often of great fame as one more revelation of self by a being whose self is worth revealing as treasure trove for our friend the psychoanalyst read the book how you will and you are sure to find that you have wasted your time as little as the energetic and acquisitive miss smythe was wont to waste hers End of section 16